chapter 11. So you can turn there in your Bibles. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, continuing to look at Faith's Hall of Fame. And uh, last week, we continued to tour Hebrews 11, looking into yet another of the galleries of the Hall of Faith, as we've been calling them. The first one we saw was the Gallery of the Patriarchs, where we were able to examine the lives and the faith of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And what did we see? Well, as we've been saying, what we saw were imperfections. We saw struggles, mistakes, and failures. And all we saw that all those patriarchs were very much human, just like us. They had the same struggles we have. And yet, through all of that, all of their real life, daily choices and actions, there was an underlying foundation of faith, all of which helps us to see these people as real. Not just some distant icon of greatness, but real people who just went through life as we do. They had a real history. Sometimes they did it in obedience and righteousness, sometimes in the flesh and in failure. And individually in all of them, we saw different aspects of a life of faith. In Abraham, we saw that the accolades of faith did not require perfection without doubt or fear. In Sarah, we saw that the accolades of faith came to her even though she saw the promises God has made to her as impossibilities. In Isaac, we saw the accolades of faith came even though he tried to manipulate God to do things the way Isaac wanted them done instead of the way God wanted them done. And in Jacob, we saw that the accolades of faith came even though most of his life was marked with selfishness and carnality. God saw through all of that to see Jacob as the man that he would become. And he had so much patience with him. And in Joseph, we saw a life that could look past the present and into a future that held hope as an example of strength for all those that were going to come after him. And then last week, we moved from there to the next gallery of these heroes of faith, the gallery of the Exodus where we were able to observe even more aspects of faith in the lives of those inductees in that gallery. We looked at the parents of Moses, and we saw that faith gave them the courage to let go of all they could control and trust God with the life of their son. And in Moses, we saw many, many aspects of faith, but chiefly that true faith begins with humility. And that gave him perseverance through suffering and a view of eternity and courage that withstood the wrath of the world. And it gave him a trust that God would protect him eternally by the blood of the Lamb. And then we saw the Hebrew nation as a whole in the wilderness. And we saw a faith that was remembered even when their fear and their humanness failed them. And then we saw the Hebrews that went into the promised land of Jericho. And we saw that faith led to a daring obedience. And then lastly, last week, we looked at Rahab the harlot. And we saw a faith that led to salvation and redemption and restoration. And one of my favorite accounts in the Bible. And today we enter into yet another of the galleries of the Hall of Faith. The gallery of the judges and the king. So with that. If you're able, let's stand and we're going to read together through our passage in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 8 and going on through Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews 11, verse 8 is where we're going to start. Where it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. 
And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has uh, prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, Subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord, thank you so much for your word and the encouragement that we can find here in the ones that have gone before us, these testimonies of the men and the women who lived real lives, who had choices to make every day and ultimately who chose you. Lord, may we have a faith that you see May we be glorified only in you. And oh Lord, may you be glorified in our lives. We praise you and we worship you and we pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, as we enter into this next gallery of faith, we'll be concentrating on Hebrews 11, 32, and 34, where we find inductees from the era of the judges and one king. And this gallery can almost feel like an afterthought, as the writer's introduction for us reads like this in verse 32, what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of. And then he gives us a list of names, a list of people, Gideon, Brack, Samson, Jephthah, David and Samuel. Well, time may have failed him to expound on these people in his letter, 
but it doesn't for us as we linger a little while in this hall of faith. All of these people that would have been very familiar to the recipients of this letter were well known to them. They, they knew who these names were. They knew the accounts of their lives. And most of them are known to us as well, some better than others, but all from the era of the judges of Israel, save for one king that's mentioned. And now the era of the judges is recorded for us mainly, as you may surmise, in the book of Judges. No big surprise there. Yes, that is the era that we're talking about. And you may want to turn there and keep your thumb there because we're going to return, refer to it throughout this, uh, this gallery as we go through it. But the book of Judges, when you read through it, it's a rather stark and shocking book filled with the ups and downs, the successes and failures, the trials and travails of the Israelites as they, they took and dwelt in the promised land. They went from disobedience to obedience to disobedience to obedience. And the very beginning of the book tells us a lot about how this part of the history of the Israelite nation goes. Look at Judges chapter 2. We're going to read through Judges chapter 2, verse 7 through 19. Look at what it says here in Judges chapter 2. It says this, So the people served the Lord all the days of who? All the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Harris, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gaash. Where all that gen when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, all the generation that had entered into the promised land, out of the wilderness, all the generation that had seen the mighty hand of God working on their behalf, that had witnessed the waters of the Jordan part so that they could cross the river. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They forgot the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers and despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Verse 16 says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet... They would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass that the when the judge was dead, that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers. By following other gods to serve them and bow down to them, they did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. That's a summary of basically what you see in the whole book of Judges. Now it's generally accepted, although we don't know for sure, that Samuel was the author of this book, of the history of the Israelites. And according to Paul in Acts 13.20, this period of history, the time of the judges last, lasted roughly 450 years. And during that time, it was a constant cycle of failure, successes, failure, successes, over and over again. 
disobedience, which led to oppression, which led to repentance, which led to deliverance, which again led to disobedience. The, the entire book of history is a constant cycle of that very repetitive pattern. The people would abandon God with disbelief and worship idols. God would judge the nation for their disobedience and they would come under the hand of oppressors. The people would cry out for God's mercy and His help. And God would have pity and would raise up a deliverer, a judge. And the people would repent and turn back to God. And eventually that judge would die and the people would again abandon God. And the cycle continued again and again, over and over throughout their history. With the entire era being summed up in a couple of places where the writer of the book of Judges wrote in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You see, God was supposed to be their king. But the people continually rejected God's plan. And instead chose to indulge whatever point of fleshly pleasure they preferred instead. They went their own way instead of God's way. So as we said, as they found themselves in bondage under judgment, they would cry out to the Lord and God would have mercy on them and send a judge as deliverer. Over that 450 years of their history, there are quite a few judges listed throughout this book of their history. And on into the book of 1 Samuel. In historical order, this is their names. We have Othniel, the first judge mentioned in Judges 3, 9 through 11. And he judged for 40 years. And after him, there was Ehud, who judged for 80 years. And then there was Shamgar. And it doesn't say for how long he judged. And then there was Deborah, and by extension, Barak. And Deborah judged for 40 years. Then there was Gideon, who judged for another 40 years. And then after Gideon, there's someone else mentioned in Judges 9, verses 1 through 57. One of Gideon's sons named Abimelech. And we're told that he ruled, per se, for three years. But here's the difference. He was a self-proclaimed ruler. He put himself in that position, along with people who supported him. And generally, he's not included in the roll call of the judges of Israel. And then there was Tola, who judged for 23 years. And then there was Jair, who judged for 22 years. And Jepheth, who judged for six years. And Ibzin, who judged for seven years. And Elon, who judged for ten years. And Abdon, who judged for eight years. And Samson, who judged for twenty years. And then it goes to Eli, the priest, who judged for forty years. And then the last judge of Israel, Samuel the priest, who judged for about twelve years until Saul was made the king. Now, out of that list of of potential candidates to be inducted in the hall of faith from this era, only a few were mentioned in Hebrews 11. And even then, not necessarily in chronological order, nor would you say necessarily in, the, in a, a, a position that you would think world-wise or human wisdom-wise would be worthy of induction. For in the gallery of the judges and the king, we see only Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jepheth, David, and Samuel. Why? Well, let's look at their lives and see what aspects of faith that we can see there. Now, the first one mentioned in Hebrews is Gideon, who isn't the first one chronologically, but he's the first one the writer of Hebrews mentioned. And we find him in Judges chapter 6 through Judges chapter 8. And in that section, we find that there's, there's this man who should not be unfamiliar to us. The people had rejected God. They were worshiping idols. They were worshiping Baal. And the Lord left them and let them fall into the hands of the Midianites for seven years. And finally, fed up, the Israelites called out to God for help. And God answered their cry by calling a man named Gideon to lead them. And where, where did that call come? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It came while he was threshing wheat. Threshing down in a wine press, hiding in fear from the marauding Midianite raiders who were coming and taking the food from the Israelites every harvest. Now, where would you usually be found attempting to thresh wheat? Well, ordinarily, you would thresh wheat by doing it someplace where there's actually a breeze. 
to carry the chaff off. It's the process of separating the kernel you want to eat from the chaff and the junk you don't want to eat. That's a simplified version of threshing. But to really do that, you need to do it out in the open. You need to do it where there might be a breeze. Gideon was hiding in the pit of a wine press. No breeze there. But he, I don't know if he was blowing on it or what he was doing. But regardless, see, that's where he was threshing his wheat. Now, it was there that the angel of the Lord came and called him, saying, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor, who's hiding in a pit from the Midianites. <laughs> you know, he didn't add that on. But the Lord did come to him while he was hiding in fear. And he called him a mighty man of valor. Now, the Lord wasn't mocking him or making fun of him for being there in a wine press. He wasn't uh, speaking down to him. But the Lord saw him for who he would become. The one used by God to deliver his people. Regardless of where he was in the moment. Well, he came out of the wine press. And he asked for a sign from the Lord. And the Lord told him to lay out an offering. And so he did. He laid out an offering of meat, broth, and unleavened bread on a rock. And the Lord consumed the offering by fire coming out of the rock. And it gave Gideon the sign he needed to know that the Lord was going to be with him. From there, Gideon destroys the altars of Baal, replaces it with an altar to God. He raised up an army to fight against the Midianites. And in a moment when he was questioning all of it, he again asked for more signs from God, as if consuming uh, your offering on a rock wasn't enough. He said, well, I really want to know you're going to be with me. And so he laid out a fleece before the Lord. He laid out a, 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 a sheepskin and gave God parameters for, okay, if you're really with me, everything's going to be wet, but that fleece is going to be dry. Or everything's going to be dry, but that fleece will be wet. You know, and he gave him all these parameters of what would really constitute a sign from God. And God, in his patience, answered those cries for assurance from Gideon and showed him definitively that he was going to be with him. An army of Israelites had rallied to Gideon, but God let him know that his army was too big. He had about 32,000 men with him. That may sound like a lot, but he was going up against a Midianite army that had 135,000 people. And God, knowing the heart of man, knew that even with that disadvantage, somehow the heart of man would ascribe a victory to their own might and valor. Look what we did. Boy, we really pulled that off. Yeah, we were outnumbered, but man, we really did it, didn't we? So God whittled those 32,000 men down to 300 men. And out of those 300 men, well, they weren't necessarily the choice soldiers of Israel, you could say. But God knew what he was doing. And he indeed used that small band of men to bring a mighty victory, but not even by their own hand. God did it all. And the Midianites destroyed themselves. Gideon did become a mighty man of valor. He boldly destroyed idols and was mightily used of God to defeat a much larger army of Midianites in faith. Yet he was also a man who doubted God's word to him at first and repeatedly asked for confirmation after confirmation. And during the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 years, there was peace in the land of Israel. But after Gideon died, the people forgot the Lord their God who had rescued them from their enemy. They even, you know, Gideon had built a memorial to what God had done. And the people somehow even twisted that. They worshipped the memorial that Gideon had made to God instead of worshipping God himself. And to top it off, they then attributed that, uh, attributed that memorial to Baal instead of to God. They forgot their real God. And they forgot the legacy of Gideon too and did not treat his family well once he died. But what we see in Gideon is a man who actually moved in the faith he did have Despite his fear and doubt, he had a faith that trusted God enough to actually take action. Now, the next one we come to actually happened, appeared in Judges before Gideon. Barak is mentioned. And we're introduced to him in Judges chapter 4. So just a, ch a chapter or so before. And we're told that Israel had done evil in the sight of the Lord, had gone off worshiping idols, and they were under the dominion of a king of Canaan named Hazor, who had sent his commander, Sisera, to oppress the Israelites. 
Now, Barak wasn't the judge of Israel. Deborah was the judge. And she was also a prophetess. But somehow, inside of this account, God inspired the writer of Hebrews to write about the one who had less faith. Deborah didn't doubt what God wanted to do, but Barak did at first. So God had revealed to Deborah that Barak was chosen to lead an army of 10,000 men to go and fight the armies commanded by Sisera. But Barak hesitated. He refused to go unless Deborah was going to go with him. He was relying on Deborah's faith to sustain his faith. But she did. She did go. But she also let him know that there would be no glory in the battle for him for his hesitation to obey. Regardless, God indeed went with Barak, and the armies of Sisera were defeated and fled before them. Sisera seemingly escaped, though, and ended up at the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, where she lulled Sisera asleep, gave him some warm milk, lulled him to sleep. He felt safe and secure, only to have her drive a tent peg right through this temple, pin him to the ground. Judges is an awesome book, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? But she lulled Sisera to sleep and drove a tent peg through, peg through his temple, killing him. And, but even with the hesitation to trust and obey and the ultimate victory coming through the hand of someone else, what does God remember? Barak is recounted as the man of faith who led the armies of Israel to deliver his people. Now, Jesus told a parable similar in thought to this portion of Barak's life. In Matthew 21, 28, Jesus told, a, uh, as he was talking about John the Baptist, and he's asking the spiritual leaders of the day, was he from God or not? Should you have listened to him or not? And they answered, we don't know. <laughs> well, Jesus went on to tell a parable. He said, but what do you think? A man has two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it, and he went. And then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. You know, God honors the obedience we show, even if it's a delayed obedience. We can begin with the biggest mistake. Oh, God, I ain't doing that. Only to have him convict us. And us repent of that and then obey. He, he honors that over the hypocrisy of one who with outward pretense says yes, but disobeys in heart and action. And that's what we see in Barak. He hesitated. He was struggling. I don't know if I want to go. I don't know if I trust that God's called me to do that just because you're saying it. Tell you what, I'll go if you go. And Deborah went, I'll go. Barak did obey. And ultimately, that faith of delayed obedience was good enough to get him enshrined in the hall of faith in Hebrews. If God's putting something on your heart to do and you're refusing to do it, oh, it's not too late to honor him. You can turn and go, Lord, I'm so sorry. I screwed that one up, but I'll do what you want me to do. Oh, and God's going to be pleased with that. He'll honor that act of obedience. We go from Barak. And next we see Samson. Samson near the end of the book of Judges, in Judges chapter uh, 13 through 16. And Israel, again, <laughs> Israel again had uh, rejected God and began worshiping idols only to be defeated and humiliated by the Philistines. And when they cried out for deliverance, the Lord brought Samson. And the account of the life of Samson, well, it's well known. We're gonna, not going to go through it in detail. But Samson was truly a man of his times. He, all by himself, is a study in complete contrasts. He's a man of great strengths and a man of great weaknesses. 
He's a man of obedience, and he's also a man of complete selfishness. He was a man of humility. He's also a man of pride. All in all, he was a picture of Israel's history, both during this period and generally speaking. He was a picture of great heights and of deep lows. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in great strength, and yet the pole and the desire of his flesh consumed him time and time again. And as he refused to bring his fleshly, selfish desires into the subjection of obedience to God, it ultimately cost him his leadership role his strength, his eyes, and ultimately his life. Samson's an important example of unfulfilled potential. Though he did great things for God, it's staggering to consider what he might have done and might have been and might, what he might have done for God if he would have humbled himself in submission and, weak, and in meekness. And yet at the end, finally, completely humbled Completely repentant, he was used mightily of the Lord to defeat the Philistines, defeating more in his death than he ever did in his life, we are told. No, I don't think he ever lived up to his potential. And he had that rather tragic ending to his life after being enticed by Delilah. But God recounts his faith. In Hebrews, that's what God recounts. God recounted his humility and repentance at the very end. God sees the ending, not just the mistakes of the flesh, the mistakes throughout his life, but the ending of humble obedience. It doesn't matter how long, how far, or how wide someone wanders in their life. It doesn't matter the sin that they struggle with or the flesh nature that they can never bring into subjection to the Lord. None of that matters when ultimately they get to the point of humility and we look at the Lord and go, oh, you were right. For Samson, it took his whole life. It, was, it didn't come till the very end. We don't have to wait that long. It doesn't have to cost us what the Lord has given us. It doesn't have to cost us our eyes or our position or our life. But if that was the cost for you, to have true repentance in your life, in the scope of eternity, it wouldn't matter. Because in the scope of eternity, you'd be seen as a person of faith. God recounted Samson's humility and repentance. God saw the end as so glorious that it superseded all the mistakes of his whole life. Even though all the potential was wasted, God still recounts him as a man of faith. Samson was accepted for that humility, not for all the works he did. Even the works he did being in the Spirit of God. What's remembered is his humility at the end. He was remembered and accepted for his faith in humility and repentance. And now we go on to one that's a pretty difficult one. Jepheth, who appeared in Judges chapter 11. Now, it's really interesting to me that this guy is included here in the Hall of Faith. This is a complicated one to consider. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on the background of his life and victory, but we're going to spend more of the time on his subsequent foolishness. In summary, Jepheth was a man, a son of a man named Gilead, but he was born of a harlot. And so he was rejected by his family and he was driven away from them. But he grew to be a mighty man of valor with a band of men that followed him. And when the people were oppressed by the Ammonites, they begged for Jepheth to come and to lead them. But he would only agree to come if, after the battle was won, they would continue to follow him and allow him to lead. Well, they agreed. They were at that point of desperation. We don't care what it takes. Just come and help us. And so he came. Now, it's an, he's an interesting guy because he first attempted negotiations and diplomacy with the Ammonites, showing a deft hand and showing wisdom and knowledge in what God had done for the children of Israel. And he attempted to bring peace through negotiations 
Well, the Ammonites rejected his entreaties. And so, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, Jephthah assembled an army and advanced in battle, defeating the Ammonites. Now, here's the deal. When he was going to the battle, he made a really foolish vow to God. We're told that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And the next thing we see in chapter 11, verse 30 and 31 is where it says, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, there shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. And I look at that and I think, what in the world are you thinking? What kind of stupid vow is that? Who's in your house that you don't care about? <laughs> you know? But I think he intended well, even though it was a foolish vow. Now such vows can be attempts to manipulate God or to put him under obligation to ourselves. I'll do this if you do that. It could be a fleshly attempt to look more godly and more spiritual to others than we may be. But either way, the reality is it's self-centered foolishness. It's far more important to just stand on God's side than to try and persuade God to be on your side. He is far more wise than you. And he has far more at stake. But Jephthah, he made this vow. After the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, which shows that even a Spirit-filled person can do really foolish things. The Holy Spirit does not overwhelm and control you and beat you into subjection. He guides you. And that guidance can be resisted, that guidance can be ignored at smaller or greater points. Now, we read what he said. And in our passages, depending on what translation you have, it basically says, whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, I'm going to offer it up as a burnt offering, which sounds even more stupid. But Jephthah, I don't think he had human sacrifice in mind. How can I think that? Well, it's indicated by the Hebrew grammar used in the statement. It's described this way, that the masculine gender of the phrase could be translated, whatever comes out or whoever comes out, and I will sacrifice it. And commenters agree that according to the most accurate Hebrew scholars, the best translation of what he's saying is, I will consecrate it to the Lord, or I will offer it as a burnt offering. That's what the phraseology is generally accepted as meaning. Many commentators read that the Hebrew is being more accurate if it's read like this. If it be a thing fit for a burnt offering, I, it shall be made one. If it for the service of God, it shall be consecrated to him. Now in the law, human sacrifice was strictly forbidden in passages such as Leviticus 18.21 and in Deuteronomy 12.31. It's almost certain that Jephthah was familiar with such passages because when he negotiated with the Ammonites, he demonstrated that he knew God's word. He knew the history of what God had done for the Hebrew people. And he knew the law. Regardless, he still made a foolish vow. And when he got home from the battle, his daughter was coming out the door to greet him. And we read this in, Ju in Judges 11, beginning in verse 34. It says, When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing. And she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass that when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you've brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I've given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. And so she said to him, My father, if you've given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. And then she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months, that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. So he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father, and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. Now Jephthah made his foolish vow sincerely. 
fully intending to keep it, yet he had not seriously considered the consequences of that vow. Therefore he was grieved when his daughter was the first to greet him out of his house. And again, like I said before, I don't know what he expected. Did he think his dog was going to come out before his daughter came out? I don't know. But regardless, his daughter went with her friends and bewailed her virginity, mourned that she would never marry. And again, the structure of these phrases indicate that it's more likely that Jephthah set his daughter aside for the tabernacle service according to the principle of Leviticus 27, 2 through 4, where ones who were set apart to God in a vow were not required to be sacrificed as animals were, but were given to the tabernacle. We know that there were women who were set apart for the tabernacle service. They were called the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They were called this in Exodus 38.8 and in 1 Samuel 2.22. It's most likely that Jephthah's daughter became one of those women who were at the tabernacle dwelling in continual service. So do we know this for sure? Well, no, we don't. We don't know this for sure. Because there are many commentators who object to this view and see no other option than to say that Jephthah horribly fulfilled his vow by the human sacrifice of his own daughter. Yet her committal to be one of the women who assembled at the tabernacle still seems the best explanation because the reality is Jephthah is listed as a hero of the faith in Hebrews 11. It's hard to think of him as doing something so contrary to God's ways and God's nature, doing something completely abhorrent to God, doing something that is prohibited by God, something so vile as offering his daughter as a human sacrifice and then still being mentioned as a man of faith in the book of Hebrews. So, no, Jephthah was a man of faith, one who made a rash and foolish vow. And I do think the best explanation is that his daughter remained in the service in the tabernacle. And there she spent her days. Never married. So Jephthah never had an heir. And his line ended there. Regardless of his foolish vow, what God remembered of Jephthah was his bold faith in victory. Not his foolish vow given in haste and in his flesh. Then we come now to David the king. And what can we say of the life of one of the most renowned men in all of the Bible? We know all about his great victories. We also know that he was an adulterous, scheming murderer. To put it bluntly, that's what we know about David. We also know he was a pretty lousy dad. That's what we know about David. In fact, there have been quite a few people that I've talked to that question David as being good at all. How could he be considered good? As his sins were so much more appalling to the human eye than Saul's were. So what is it that makes him worthy of inclusion in such a place as the Hall of Faith with all of those shortcomings in real life? Well, in the book of 1 Samuel, When Samuel was anointing the one who would replace Saul as king, he was directed to the house of a man named Jesse. And in reviewing the sons of Jesse, Samuel looked at the impressive stature of one of David's older brothers. He looked at Eliab. And he said, uh, he said, so it was that when they came, that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Before me, look. Look at this dude. He is awesome. (laughs) I figure he's tall and broad and strong and must be a a guy that's just yoked but the Lord looked to Samuel he said don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I've refused him for the Lord does not see as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks where you guys know this the Lord looks at the heart all we can see is the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart Therein lies the difference between Saul and David. Saul, by outward signs, really wasn't all that bad. Sure, he had major anger issues, but no huge outward sins are really attributed to him. His issues were inward. 
He was full of pride. He had no desire to really have his own relationship with God. Continually defying the wishes of God and going about things his own way. He wanted to stand in his self. He defied God in prideful arrogance. Whereas even with all of his well-known shortcomings, David desired and longed for God. He truly repented of his actions in humility and trust. He loved God even though he was a man oftentimes driven by his flesh nature. Both James and Peter tell us that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And in Psalm 101, David wrote these words. Listen to the psalm, this psalm. David wrote this. I will sing of your mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land that I may cut off all the evil doers from the city of the Lord. What God inspired David to write is that one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, God looks at him and goes, oh, that guy? I can't endure that. He sees that as so abhorrent because that was the original sin that cost Lucifer his position in heaven. Pride arose in his heart. I will ascend like the Most High. I will be sitting on the mountain of God. I will be, I, I, I. And iniquity was found in him and he was cast out of heaven. That's the same sin that Saul had. I don't care what the outward sin looks like. That inward sin, if I would look at it and go, oh yeah, that's the same sin that Lucifer had. I think that's a pretty serious sin. Probably more serious than all those outward ones. You see, David understood the grace and mercy of God. And even with all of his many sins and shortcomings, that humility of heart, that desire for real relationship with God, that willingness to truly repent, made David a man referred to this way by Paul in Acts 13.22, where he, Paul said, after removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. That's who God saw David to be, regardless of his fleshly shortcomings. There's a short list of godly attributes that we could see in this flawed but faith-filled man. David was humble. David was reverent. David was trusting. David loved God. David worshipped God. And most importantly, David had a repentant heart. Those are attributes of humility. Attributes of a man that God can work with. And as best summed up, I think, that heart that we see in David is best summed up in Psalm 51 after David, for a whole year, had endured hardness of heart after he had taken Bathsheba committed adultery with her and then killed her husband and then tried to hide it all. After a year of that, Nathan the prophet comes and calls him on the carpet. And David, pricked to the heart, immediately repented. And in Psalm 51, we have his psalm of repentance where he said, Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. 
purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you've broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bowls on your altar. You look at that. He had just murdered a, a dude to get his wife. And he tried to cover it up for a year. And when he was called on the carpet, he repented absolutely and completely, seeing God for who he is crying out for mercy. That's a heart that God responds to. David loved the things that God loves. David was grieved by the things that grieved the heart of God. David trusted and loved God. David desired real relationship with God, valuing that over even being king. That heart of humility and love, even in the face of great outward sin, was of so much more value than Saul's defiant and prideful arrogance in a heart that had no desire for the things of God. And it tells us so much of what grace really is. Because that man was described as a man after God's own heart. God looking past all of his mistakes, all of his screw-ups, all of his failures, and seeing a heart of humility that repented before him and just wanted to fall more in love with him. That gives me hope. <laughs> and now the last one we come to in this gallery, well, it's Samuel, the final judge of Israel. The miracle baby Samuel was dedicated to the Lord as a child by his mother. He grew up in the service of the tabernacle under the watchful eye of Eli the priest, and he was also a judge. Samuel served the nation of Israel faithfully from childhood to old age, and yet after all of that, after all of that faithful service his whole life, the people began to clamor for a king like all the nations around them. We don't want you as our judge. We want a king. And this displeased Samuel. And he felt rejected. But he immediately began to pray. He knew where to turn. And as he did, God corrected him on that point of feeling rejected and saved him from bitterness. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them that the behavior of the king will reign over them. With that, God got Samuel's eyes off of himself and back onto God. Samuel, it's not you they've rejected. Oh, it's me. You may be experiencing what I'm going through, but it's me they're rejecting, not you. God saved him from bitterness. And Samuel responded. He obeyed God. He anointed the man that God had showed him to be the one who would be king. And even with the sting and the pain of rejection, Samuel didn't grow bitter. He remained in faithful service throughout the reign of King Saul. Even though Saul failed completely and aggrieved Samuel mightily. And subsequently, Samuel was able to anoint David as king in Saul's place. 
Samuel died before being able to see David come to the throne, but he remained faithful to the end in loving obedience to the Lord. Samuel finished well. He could have chose bitterness. He could have chose that. And what would have happened to the children of Israel if he had? What example would he have left for them? But Samuel didn't. He chose to believe God. And he understood. And he didn't become bitter. So what do you see in these men? Well, in Gideon, we saw that a man who actually moved in the faith that he did have. Despite his fear and doubt, he had a faith that trusted enough to take action. In Barak, we saw, we saw delayed obedience. He hesitated to trust and obey. He refused to go without Deborah. Yet God remembers his faith and ultimately his obedience. In Samson, we saw a man who couldn't submit to humble obedience until he was humbled completely. But God sees the faith of that humble, in repentant ending as being greater than all the mistakes of his prideful self-willed life prior to that god remembers jepheth for his bold faith and victory not the foolish vow that was given in haste david shows us that the power of true humility and repentance is an amazing thing and that the love the grace <coughs> and the mercy <coughs> that is found in our god oh it's everlasting and in Samuel, he shows us that the faith to overcome rejection without bitterness, which allowed him to serve faithfully and allowed him to finish well. Well, we still have a couple of more galleries in this chapter to go through. We're going to see the gallery of the prophets, and then we're going to see a gallery of other people that he mentions as well. But what we've seen so far just encourages my faith so much. As we see all these people that had real lives, real problems, real mistake, and yet what God accounts to them is pretty amazing to me. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. That even in our weakness, even inside of our flesh nature, that you choose to work in us and through us and with us, seeing the end from the beginning and not being so caught up in the present, in today or in our past, that you go, well, there's nothing I could do with you. But oh Lord, as we just come to you and we submit ourselves to you, all oh, the things that you could do. May we not wait until the end to make that choice to walk in humility before you. May we be usable by you for whatever it is you would want to do in and through us. For your glory, not our own. Not walking in foolishness of ourself or our flesh, but oh, choosing you. Oh, may we choose you. May we repent quickly when we fail and when we sin. May we repent in honesty and submission before you. And oh Lord, may you cleanse us anew every day because the world around us just throws the spots of sin at us as well as the ones that we choose to pick up on our own. Oh Lord, may we walk with you and be unspotted by the world. Keep us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>